Hi, my name is Jean-Baptiste and I'm the president of Videolan and the lead dev of VLC. The Videolan project is a project that was started by students. Um, it was done by students who were basically managing the network, uh, the computer network at the, on the campus. Every um, computer from the students were managed by the, a team of students and not by the, the university, which is a bit unusual. Um, and this uh, group of people is actually are actually the people who started the Videoland project. Um, and when I was at the university, I was one of those. I was a vice president of the, of the control of the network, and that's how I got into VLC. Before, I never had some actual programming experience. Everything was just a bit theoretical at school, at university. So the first task I actually did on VLC was a very tedious task and quite difficult, which was to update all the dependencies of VLC, which is around 100 libraries that are done in C++, for the ver Windows version of VLC. And that is very difficult because it's a lot of tooling, lots of cross compilation, and you need to know a lot about compilation. And of course, at that time, I didn't know. So I spent a lot of time on that. One of the genius moves, which was of course not actually thought about, but more a mistake, was that when you installed VLC, it was just playing everything without you needing to install some codec packs. And it was a huge mess. You needed to double install some, double click and install some codec packs, and they were a nightmare. Half of them had malware in them, and even when you did that, it was not sure that it would work. Um, and then you would install another codec pack that was destroying even the, the first one. So it was a big mess. Um, with VLC, it just works. You don't even need to install VLC to use it. You can just unzip it um, and it works. So VLC being a success is a lot of uh, factors uh, that are independent, but in the whole makes it VLC quite popular. Um, there are some organization um, reasons. The first one is that we are open source and we don't have marketing or people who basically decide at the top a feature and push it down to the users like Real Player or BS Player has been doing. Um, and so when we add a feature, it's because people actually need it and people actually want it. Um, the second one is that it's easy. Um, maybe the UI is not beautiful, but the UX is great. You double click a file, it will work. Whatever happens, it just works. Um, you can play, pause, full screen. Then, of course, there are more advanced options, but for most of the people, it just works fine. You can trust us. We've been there for 15 years. We do it with a clear nonprofit, clear goals, um, so people know where we are going and they can trust us. And then on macOS, it was the only way to play DVDs for a long time. And also, you could play videos that were being downloaded and VLC allowed you to play directly before f uh, reading the whole file. Keeping VLC free is obvious, and without ads seems obvious. It's a no-brainer for me. I know people are, are, are focusing a lot on that part, but for me, it's just the way it should be. So it's not, any, um, it's not difficult for me to keep it like that. Money is a jail. You don't need, you need to have, of course, you need a decent amount of money, right? But like your programming, your um, developer in one of the most active industries, there is almost no, virtually almost no unemployment. You're going to be correctly paid in most of the cities where you are. This is good. Sure, more money would be fun, but most of the people I know who have more money are annoying. Um, and if it's to be slave to your life, it's useless. Because it was done as a student project, it's very easy to enter and add a new feature. Um, it's a, a very modular approach, and so you have you know, normal VLC installation around 500 modules. So you can come and just work on a very small part and improve a very small part without breaking everything else. And that's very good because that's how you get a lot of contributions. VLC has over 700 or 800 authors since the beginning of the VLC project, and that's because it's quite easy to contribute. In fact, a feature, a patch gets into VLC not because it's useful, but it's because it's maintainable. Why is that? Well, if you send me a, patches, a patch or two, 
there is a high likelihood that in six months you're gone from the project. People change job, change wife, have kids, uh, accidents and so on. So everything in VLC is done so that we can go on without you, which means that we attach a lot of time on quality, which means the code you're sending, can I maintain it in six months or in one year or two years? And that's why we have a lot of features in VLC that are completely useless um, and some that everyone thinks are very important and that we don't have. And it's not because we're stupid. It's just like the code to enter must be clean. If it's not clean, you don't get in. So many developers don't know how a computer works. Um, understanding computer architecture is extremely important and absolutely like it's less than one percent of the people I see in interviews that they know about their computers um, and if you really focus on high language uh, you need to understand lower level language um, my advice is usually to for people to know um, C one Python Ruby Go or whatever JavaScript and a, a functional programming. You don't need to master it, but you need to at least understand how it works because then it's going to help you on other languages. There is a lot of good developers that are actually technicians of one framework in one specific language, but it's useless because what's going to happen in two years or three years? You need to understand what is under your uh, language to, to, to be a good programming uh, developer. Pure code testing is not perfect. It, it has a lot of bias, but for VLC, I need people with creativity and people who think outside of the box. And that's not by code testing that I'm going to, to, say, to see that. The question I ask in technical interviews are very generic questions. I'm never going to ask you how, how you're going to uh, basically copy a string by removing the backslash and so on. That is something that any guy can take and learn. And so my questions are very generic because um, if you start answering to them, then you're going to show that you've been looking at it. You've been looking at this subject for a long time and you like it. For example, when I see a JavaScript developer, I ask them a um, question about the HTTP stack. And a lot of them are just like, yeah, but I don't really know networking. And you, I'm just like, you don't know networking while most of your time is spent on the web over a network. It's just, okay, you're maybe a good developer, but you're an average developer. I, I need good developers. And the good developers are the guys who are going to, when they look at JavaScript, they're going to go on Wikipedia and click on them and they're going to see web and they're going to click on web and the first link is HTTP and then they tell them about the stack. What is a networking stack? I don't need them to understand all of it, but at least be interested enough in their work that they are going to spend time on that. Um, and that's how you find good developers. Mm -hmm.